Okay. Welcome back. Um, let's see. So we'll just go a few minutes over if that's our interview. Uh, I now have the pleasure of introducing to you Sherry Richland, who received her doctorate at the California Institute of Integral Studies in the Philosophy, Cosmology, and Consciousness consciousness program. Her dissertation is titled The Return of the Sage, A New Cosmology Meets the Way of Heaven and Earth in the Ching. She is also author of a book titled Wanting and Dream to Waken. Uh, she's had articles published in Parabola and Revision Magazines, and today she will be speaking to us on Please help me welcome you. Uh, I have to apologize at the beginning, since this is literally all foreign material. Uh, if you can hold your questions till afterwards, I'm sort of sprinting to the end to be able to explain this well enough. So afterwards, or tomorrow in the discussion, I will be able to hear your questions. Okay, next slide. I want to frame this in uh, John Cobb's comment here, and then this topic of the whole the whole experience we're having for these three and four days is magnificent conference. Okay, John Cobb says, a particular worldview or vision would be wonderfully helpful in shifting the direction of our collective behavior uh, from its current disastrous course. It is not possible to think deeply without addressing, about addressing the problems, without addressing the assumptions that underlie them, and more than that, outlining a different approach. That's what we've all been talking about. That approach, no, sorry. sorry, back. That approach, in the words of Thomas Berry, shifts from seeing the world as a collection of objects to viewing it as a communion of subjects. I'm sure many of you have heard this before. How we do that is the next question. And there's been such a wonderful conversation already about subjectivity and objectivity, the way this is a continuation of this. So Cobb is saying it is a view with ecological relations at its core. This is a seismic shift in consciousness that would transform how we live and face our problems. Okay, now this is going to be, going to the other side here now, you're thinking, well, how is Confucius related to Whitehead? I'm just going to give you one quote that describes that, and then I'm going to go into Confucius, since he's the least known. This is a contemporary book. In fact, I met this man at the last Whitehead conference, Chuming Chung, New Dimensions of Confucian, New Confucian Philosophy. Okay. He says, many Chinese philosophers have made the suggestion that Whitehead's philosophy resembles Chinese philosophy to a great measure. What these Chinese philosophers have in mind is that Whitehead had developed a system based upon the fundamental notion of reality as a process of change, which has always been the fundamental notion of Chinese philosophy beginning with the Book of Changes, the Ching, and that's what I'm going to begin. Is there more to that? No. Okay. Now, right next door, I want to tell you. I think it was next door yesterday, and you, I think he might be speaking somewhere. Uh, Shiha Wong, whom I also met at the last Whitehead conference, has just been doing incredible things in China. He's translated the Mian Chapter of Science into Chinese, and he's established, I think, something like 25 process philosophy or constructive postmodernism centers in China. So, constructive postmodernism, process philosophy, Whitehead. We're talking about the same thing. Okay. He, in an article that he wrote, and I've also seen him speak on this, he describes a recent survey that was conducted in China about the most valuable theoretical point of view in 2012. The following view of Professor Tom at Peking University was selected as the top one. And that's, I just was saying, it's so exciting to me that here's this other hemisphere, and they were meeting like, Right next door, you probably bumped into them in the hall. In the end of the last century, this is Professor Tom speaking, contemporary. In the end of, well, he's passed away. In the end of the last century, constructive postmodernism, based on process philosophy, proposed integrating the achievements of the first enlightenment in postmodernism and called for the second enlightenment. First enlightenment was modernization in China. The two broadly influential movements in China today are. The zeal for traditional culture and constructive postmodernism. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. 
if these two trends can be combined organically under the guidance of Marxism, which is to say the ruling Communist Party and, and Marxist uh, philosophy, China can complete its first enlightenment in realizing its modernization and also very quickly enter into the second enlightenment and become the standard bearer of a postmodern society. Okay, I love this. I won't, we have to read this whole thing, but here is the president, Xi Jinping, holding the hand of this philosopher I just quoted from. Mm -hmm. And he's honoring him, as it says, China's top philosophy scholar and Sinology master. This is announcing his death. But it describes the work that he did in developing, enlarging the Confucius canon, collecting all of these works together, uh, due to be completed in 2025, but 5,000 classics and so on. He's a Confucian scholar, traditional and Chinese philosophy scholar. But this is my favorite line of this, and it almost gives you the flavor of what a real Confucian scholar was, and still is. Tang, however, rejected being labeled the master of sinology by academic circles, prefer preferring to regard himself as a humble thinker. And this is important because, very important, as you'll see when we go along here, the quality of being right at the beginning is important and it counts and it has to go all the way through. Okay, next. Now, you may recognize this man by now. If not, you've been asleep for the last few days. Um, it must be, I'm setting up now this particular idea of whiteheads that I'm going to follow through in, in Confucianism. He's saying it must be one of the motives of a complete cosmology to construct a system of ideas which brings the aesthetic, moral, and religious interests into relation with those concepts of the world which have their origin in natural science. And I love the fact that in this track, this has been going on the whole time. I think that's, he must be so happy. Mm -hmm. Okay, now one of the things I like to do is to define how, how I'm using the terms consistently. Cosmology in particular is used in so many different ways. I apologize. Uh, cosmos, I'm going to the American Heritage Dictionary. Cosmos is defined as the universe regarded as an orderly, harmonious whole. Cosmology, the study of the physical universe considered as a totality of phenomena in time and space. The astrophysical study of the history, structure, and constituent dynamics of the universe. Well, what you can see here is that there is a disconnect. Cosmology isn't really in this definition of study of the cosmos. Okay, next. Now, forgive me for using this simplistic, almost cartoon model. I want you to know I'm just using it as a metaphor. Any neuroscientists in this room have already dropped dead at the sight of this. But anyway, <laughs> it's, I'm really just using it metaphorically. I will, though, pick out um, a couple of major characteristics that I think are still seriously regarded in the field and have certainly gone into our Main Street conversation about the left and right brain. The left brain uh, has been seen as the dominant place for linear sequential thinking. And that would be certainly Western language. And notice that in Western language, built into our language is a subject and an object. Subject, or object, built into the language. OK. Now, needless to say, we wouldn't even be here doing what we're doing if we didn't have all the marvelous things that have come out of science, uh, the analytical thinking that has been described as at least dominant in the left brain. We come to the right brain, and the right brain is described again in sort of the common conversation as the center for images, takes things in as wholes, and there's still research going on about it as being the dominant center for emotion. Okay, now what's really the tissue that connects these is actually called the corpus callosum, but I've always preferred to call it the colossal corpse. <laughs> um, or translate as that, really means the tough body. But I call it the colossal corpse because it's this dead zone between these two modes. It has tended to be a dead zone between the two modes. And I have also, just metaphorically here, when I say east, I'm really, you know, I'm concentrating on China here, on the Orient and the West. You can see, in a sense, this would be like cosmos and, well, put that there, cosmos and cosmology, loosely speaking. But they are connected, and it's just a matter of sort of reviving the course. Okay, next please. <laughs> okay, now this is by Fung Yulan, who, who was the first one in China to really write in the, the history of Chinese philosophy, and it's still very, very important in China. 
50 years later, it's translated into English, and it's still one of our absolutely primary sources on um, the history of Chinese thought. So he says, Chinese philosophers, for the most part, have not regarded knowledge as something valuable in itself, and so have not sought knowledge for the sake of knowledge. It might have a direct bearing upon human happiness. Chinese philosophers have preferred to apply this knowledge to actual conduct that would lead directly to this happiness, rather than to hold what they consider to be empty discussions about it. So that's coming from the other side. And there's another quote I, I, I'm not using this time, but where he describes why the ego didn't arise in Chinese thought and had, how that also altered the Chinese philosophy. Okay, now we're going to go to the West a little bit and see some of the new approaches that are trying to correct this imbalance. Um, I'm sure you've never heard of Richard Tarnas, but I, I recommend this work, uh, Cosmos and Psyche. <clears throat> and he'll be talking about this, I'm going to guess some more tomorrow that will flesh this out more, but I've just pulled this one quote out. Disenchantment, the denial of intrinsic meaning and purpose, essentially objectifies the world and thereby denies subjectivity to the world. To objectify the world is to remove from it all subjective categories such as meaning and purpose by perceiving these projections of what are now regarded as the only true subjects, human beings. Again, this has been an ongoing theme throughout our discussions here. Next, please. Okay, then we have Thomas Berry speaking directly on this subject. Um, does everyone know who Thomas Berry is? is? Is there someone I should? Okay, just very quickly, Thomas Berry with Brian Swim, whom you'll see tomorrow, uh, wrote the Universe Story and among many other things they did. And, and Thomas Berry is certainly one of the first and most eloquent of the conservation movement very early on. And he's much more than that, but uh, this is who we're talking about. So Thomas Berry says, did I already say this? No, I didn't. It's this, I, he's repeating the same thing. We gave away our subjectivity, our very souls, to the objective reasoning mind. You might say we conspired in our own diminishment, diminishment in agreeing to live a divided life within interiority or subjective. Wait, I didn't read that right there. We conspired in our own diminishment in agreeing to live a divided life when interiority or subjectivity got lost in the process of progress. This summarizes what we've been saying right along here in, as a characteristic of like modernity, but also the new voices and new thinkers. And Thomas, not all that good. Okay, I must have waved. Did I wave at you? <laughs> all right. Uh, now, we're going to jump right in here into Chinese uh, tradition. Uh, I don't know if you all know the I Ching, and I'm not talking directly on the I Ching, so you'll just have to take for granted what you see that I'm describing. But an important thing about that, if you know of it at all, the translation of um, I Ching is the Book of Changes. Uh, it actually begins, Fuxi is basically a legendary uh, figure in the history of China, sort of lost in the myth of history, but he is given credit for being the culture hero who invents Chinese civilization. And he also is the person to whom the magic tortoise came out of the river with the I Ching trigrams on its back. You'll see more about that in a moment. But the point is, they both arise together. So this is really right there at the foundation of Chinese culture. OK, it begins as a lone tortoise shell divination, uh, and then it changes. But I'm not going to be talking so much about the divination aspects of it. What I want you to keep in mind, we have 2500 BC. That's just, I'm using traditional dates. Scholars have disputed these and brought them, well, we don't even know for sure about Yao and Shun, except that the Chinese Book of History, and they're very great record keepers, uh, puts Yao as the first emperor of China at 2300 BC, followed by Shun, and in fact, some other sage kings. Remarkable people. You're going to meet Yao in a moment. Just to give you, again, where we stand in the timeline here. And you come up to around 1100 BC, still BC, to 1100 and 1000. And from now on, I put that line there because thanks to an eclipse that everyone can agree on, we can actually date the rest of the people are historical figures. Mm -hmm. So King Wen and his son, the Duke of Zhou, not only launched the Zhou dynasty, but they also um, put the first words to the Yijin. So they are. Um, the second and third in the tradition of the I Ching sages. First, Fushi, they are the second and third. 
And the fourth I Ching sage is Confucius. Uh, Confucius' dates are five seven, um, 551 to 478 Lao Tzu, maybe around that time. Uh, keep in mind, because I assume they're going to talk about the second axiom of age tomorrow. Keep in mind that Confucius is smack in the middle of the first axial age. He is a contemporary of Buddha, of Pythagoras, of Heraclitus, maybe even of Zoroaster, maybe of Lao Tzu. I mean, this is quite a burst, as you put it. Okay, so uh, then again, just in the timeline, a thousand AD, a thousand AD, there's another surge in Confucianism, because around the first century, Buddhism is introduced into China. And that becomes so, so important in China. That by 1000 AD, these marvelous uh, Neo-Confucian sages, they definitely will be sages, Chongyi, Zhuxi, Xiaolong, and others, really go deeper into Confucian texts uh, inspired by Buddhism and challenged by that in a way. And so they come forward with, with even more wonderful uh, material, Neo-Confucian you know, material. Okay, in the beginning, I mentioned that from a very early date in the Shang Dynasty, they used um, the scapular of an ox, oracle bones, for their oracle. I'm not going into detail about that, but there's this one point I want you to keep in mind. In oracle inscriptions from the Shang Dynasty, the act of the ancestors in meeting the gods was called Bin. Whenever I double these, it's the two wave trials and pinion system. It's called Bin. Dead ancestors were often seen in the records of the kings to Bin Jan Shang King, High God, in the course of which the king's requests from the profane world were turned over to the supreme being. Next, please. Okay, this single word seems to embrace ideas of prayer, divination, reception, and petition. It's this opening up. It has to be seen, but opening up between heaven and earth by the person of the sage or king. Through the instrument of the oracle or the ancestor, usually within the sacred precinct of the temple, the sage penetrates the world of heaven. And it's mainly this word, word theme that I want you to keep in mind because it's going to appear again. This would seem to extend also to the actual task of taking astronomical measurements of the heavens necessary to make the adjustments to the calendar. It's way, way back. Okay, these are called the ten wings. They're ten, and they're part of the classic text now. They're the ten ancient commentaries on the I Ching, on what King Wen and the Duke of Cho and so on had created. And they're now part of what we call the I Ching. And the one, I'll mostly be drawing on the great commentary the treatise, Da Chuan. These are traditionally regarded as being written by Confucius. Scholars now say that these writings are later. But keep in mind that traditionally these are part of the body of Confucianism. And the Neo-Confucians do wonderful things with them. Now, I happen to love this very much. It comes from, let's see, this one I think is from the actual. In ancient times, the holy sages made the Book of Changes thus. They invented the Yarostock Oracle in order to lend aid in a mysterious way to the light of the gods. I love that. I mean, that's a participatory. Mm -hmm. universe. Mm -hmm. They put themselves in accord with Tao, the way of the universe, and its power, which is actually the Tao Di Ching, and the virtue is the more common translation of that. Imagine, this means that the universe has a virtue, and the virtue is Tao. Okay. And in conformity with this, the way of the universe laid down the order of what is right. By thinking through the order of the outer world to the end, like our science. And by exploring the law of their nature to the deepest core, all one process, inward and outward, exploring their nature to the deepest core, they arrived at an understanding of destiny. It's really lovely, don't you think? I mean, for an ancient work, it's just so beautiful. Okay, next, please. Now, I mentioned Yao, 2300 BC is a date given. Um, this is really important because here is a figure uh, who's very important. He's like, you know, a Lincoln or a Washington in China, even though much more ancient than that, in terms of the way he's taught in the schools. So he was on either side of the Cultural Revolution to children. 
because he embodies what I, what I just read from the eighth grade. The Emperor Yao became a pattern for the Chinese people of an enlightened and virtuous ruler who studied the ways of heaven and earth and used his observations to improve and bring order to their lives. Now this is directly from the Book of History, as I said, this is 8th century BC. Examining into an antiquity, we find that the Emperor Yao is reverential, intelligent, accomplished, and thoughtful, naturally, without effort. He strived a great deal to come to this natural and without effort uh, this mode. The display of these qualities reached to the four extremities of the empire and extended from earth to heaven. He was able to make the capable and virtuous distinguished and thence proceeded to the love of the nine classes of his kindred, who all became harmonious. He also regulated and polished the people of his domain, who all became brightly intelligent. Finally, he united and harmonized the myriad states of the empire, and lo, the black-haired people were transformed. The result was universal concord, cosmos. But the cosmos involved also a study of the cosmos as the heavens, as the earth. Next, there's a little more from this. Thereupon, Yao commanded Xu and He in reverent accordance with their observation of the white heavens. And they did this every year so that they could correct the calendar right. Uh, observation of the white heavens to calculate and delineate the movements and appearances of the sun, moon, stars, and the zodiacal spaces. And so, my highlighting, to deliver respectfully the seasons to the people. I mean, there's a lost book of the concept, but anyway. <laughs> he separately <laughs> commanded the second brother, she, to reside in you in what was called the Bright Valley, and there respectfully to receive as a guest the morning sun. And the word for receive as a guest is the opening up. And to adjust and arrange the labors of the spring. The emperor said, go and be reverent. This commenced with some of the earlier talks and conversations. I love Yao. I, in the last year of his life, oh, could you go back? Um, in the last year of his life, I had the privilege of visiting Thomas Berry, and I, I read this to him. I said, Thomas, Yao was the first cosmologist. He read all of these in Chinese. He was a great, he was a cultural historian, and he had been in China, taught in China, read these texts in Chinese, like I was finally able to do, at least well enough to, to grasp what I think were the inherent concepts that were not always in the translation. Please. <coughs> okay, just this happens to be, many of you probably already know this, and it's the only thing I know this I'm going to take from Lao Tzu, but it's such a beautiful description of Tao. There was something formed in chaos, it existed before heaven and earth, still, it's solitary, it alone stands without state, uh, change, it is all pervasive without being exhausted. I do not know its name, I'll call it. Okay. Tao. Yes. Very nice. Isn't it? Something very common about that. Okay, the character for one, we're going to have a little Chinese lesson now. No quiz, very simple. The character for one is pronounced yi, which by the way is yi ching. They're different words, but just keep that in mind. Its philosophical definition, coming from yi wu's Chinese philosophical terms, is the essence, the practice, and the function of the way. Yeah. Next, please. In this concept, in this context, ye is not a noun but a verb, not an object but a process. For this reason, I like to think of it as one. Okay? What are you here? We'll move on. Are you ready now to go to two? <laughs> Double character for one. These little things, by the way, are just the brush brush stroke. They're just single <clears throat> lines. It doubles the character for one and can express the two realms of heaven and earth, each with its own process of one. That one says. In heaven, the images are completing on earth, the forms are completing. Okay, this from the great treatise. Therefore, there is in the change, in the Yuching, the changes, the great primal beginning, Tai Chi. And this is the first place that Tai Chi appears in a text in China. So it's, it's not until around 12th century AD that, that Tai Chi Chuan comes into being. And this, this figure, iconic figure we know of, comes much later in the same way, like around the 12th century. But I put it in here just so we have it in our minds. This is called the Tai Chi symbol. These two forces, these, these bring forth the two primary forces, the two modes, Qin and Gun, 
And these are the first two uh, hexagrams of the 64 of the I Ching. One is all yang lines, one is all yin lines. Um, the creative receptive, yeah, the hexagrams are heaven and earth, the creative and receptive. Now, I'm going to show you how this works. This is the most economical cosmic shorthand you are ever going to find. Again, remember, this is later. I just put this to keep this in our minds because we're so familiar with it. A yang line, characteristic of yang line, yang line the primary ones are others, are heat, light, firmness, and it's active or activity. Yin, cold, dark, yielding, and still. Okay, next. Now, this is, in the, in the next stage, these are, these are doubles. So you have yang and yin, and then you add a yang and yin line to this one, yang and yin to this one, and now you have four. So it says, that which lets now the dark, now the light appear, is called that. The four images are produced by the oneing of the light and darkness, heat and cold. We experience them as the four seasons. Now let's look at this. Here we have two yin lines. We have an increased amount of cold, increased amount of darkness, increased amount of stillness, and winter. Next, please. Things, in, things always come up from the bottom and go out from the top. So now, yang lines come up underneath, and so we have a little increase of warmth, and of light, and of activity. We have spring. Okay? Full increase of yang, light, heat, activity, summer, and then the next. You see this creep in underneath, the yin comes back, and it's this, the soft, the stillness, and the cold and the decreasing light we have at the bottom. These are not the only meanings of this. To be honest, this is my sense of what the four images are. It's a relationship of light and these characteristics. Okay, next please. Now I've also taken this and made this diagram from um, the second part of chapter 11 of the Dutch one. It says, there, thereupon the eight trigrams were realized they interacted and afterward the 10,000 things were born and written. So we're going up to everything. 10,000 things means all things, all things under heaven. So Tai Chi means the supreme ultimate. It's not the Chi of Chi energy. It means the supreme ultimate of the largest expanse. And I imagine um, Tao, like the implicate order, Wong's implicate order, kind of being unmanifest here, but then it comes and moves through all of this, and from this come the two modes, the yin and the yang. And just a quick comment, because I think it's so important. Uh, Yi Wu, when he taught this class in Chinese philosophical terms, we used this book, and someone said, well, you don't have yin or yang in your book. And he said, well, I'm only doing, I'm not using any compound words, just single words. And somebody else said, well, yin, yang? You don't have either of those. And, and he laughed and he said, yin yang, yin yang not single word, yin yang compound word. Uh, it's so, so important. We, we do separate them, but they are just two modes of the same thing. Okay, there's the four images. You see, they put the yin line on top of the yang, the yin yang. Then they do that again. You see, you add that to the top. And now they have the eight trigrams. Earth, mountain, water, wind, thunder, fire, lake, and heaven. These are traditionally the characteristics, characters, characteristics of the eight trigrams. There are others too, but these are the basic ones. Next, please. Okay, you end up with 64 hexagrams when you double all of those trigrams. Okay, someone asked me once when I, when I gave this talk, why did they stop at 64? And I said, you know, I don't know. Why did they stop at 64 codons in the DNA? And look how much we've gotten out of that. So mm -hmm. I, I can't answer that question, but anyway, next, please. All right, now this is really important. I like this. I mean, I thought about it, but I finally made a slide about it. Here we have the West and the East. And all during our trajectory and our history, we were looking for the building blocks of matter. And so here's the periodic table of elements, which is what our science is founded on. The Chinese, throughout all that time, had this different trajectory. They were looking for units of change. And so, these are the 
And someone were in there that says, <coughs> there are just six empty lines, just six empty lines through which the yin and the yang flow. But it's dynamic. These are like snapshots of change, just caught. But they have a lot of meaning built up behind them. OK, next, please. Now, I come back to this. Um, think of this almost as a tree. This is, this is called a philosophy of organism, just like what does. And this is like a tree in the way it develops. And I call this direction, which will go, which takes you up to the 10,000 things by the time you double all of those. And so the creative action moves in this direction. There's no big bang. This happens all that this is how everything comes into being. It's not over time. This is how everything is coming into being. Now, what is a sage? Why did I call my dissertation the return of the sage? It is the no, no, no. No <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I, I use my hand. I'm going to watch for this. How about I'll do this like this and if that goes up? Um, okay. What a sage does, well, a sage has created this system, but a, a sage can go back down through meditation or through whatever they use, prayer. They could return back down, down, down through the 10,000 things and return to the one. And so here we have again Whitehead. Creativity is the ultimate principle by which the many, which are the universe, disjunctively become the one actual occasion, which is a form of one, uh, which is the universe conjunctively. The creative advance is the application of this ultimate principle of creativity to each novel situation which it originates. Okay, now. This is Sushir, this is from Sushir, this is going to be 11th century. This is long before Whitehead. But look how beautifully he puts, I think, the same idea that Whitehead is describing. All the Lee principles, patterns under heaven have always been one, but the one cannot be held fast. Yes. This is why the sages made it clear that the yin and the yang and variation and transformation originally came from one, but through interaction arrived at infinitely. Now, as for the coming forth from one but reaching the infinite, when people observe this, they think there are infinite differences. It was one. Okay, now this is the uh, hexagram number one, all young lines, the creative, and through this comes the masculine. And on this side, we have all yin lines, it's the receptive, and out of this will come the feminine. Okay, next. The way of the creative works through change and transformation so that each thing receives its true nature and destiny and comes into permanent accord, and I've said becomes perfectly attuned with a great harmony. That's the Chinese term, and that's cosmos, of course. This is what furthers and what perseveres. The receptive in its riches carries all things. Its nature is in harmony with the boundless. It embraces everything in its breath, breath and illumines everything in its greatness. Through it, all individual beings attain success, prosper. And then this next great line uh, from another one of the wings. Success is the coming together of all that is beautiful. I bet you didn't know that, did you? <laughs> surprise, surprise. Um, this satisfies Whitehead's description of the importance of the aesthetic in the cosmology. It's a wonderful message. Okay, but the two realms, heaven and earth, must themselves be integrated for the higher wanting to complete itself. And so there are three. Are you following this? One, two, three? Okay. The third realm is the realm of the human added in the middle, the smaller one in the central position, and it's nevertheless one of the three powers of the universe. Because again, it's a very participatory universe, and it needs the human in this description. Okay, next, please. Now, one way that a hexagram is divided is this obvious way where there's a, one trigram above, one below. I've depicted this because there's sort of their archetypal places, earth below and heaven above. But the other way that the trigram is uh, traditionally, the hexagram is traditionally divided, is this way. So the human realm is in the center made up of one yang line, one yin line. So the human becomes the anvil, the anvil upon which opposites struggle together, upon which creativity really happens in the human. Okay, next please. 
Their purpose, the ancient sages, was to follow the order of their nature, remember the inward to their deepest nature, and of faith. Therefore, they determined the Tao of heaven and called it the dark and the light. They determined the Tao of the earth and called it the yielding and the firm. They determined the Tao of the human, we'll say, and called it love and the Thomas Berry, again, you know, he worked with the original characters too. I didn't know he had done any of this. And after I worked with these characters and so on in Rebel, he wrote it. He just nailed it. He says the Chinese have a definition of the human as the Xun. Someone earlier mentioned the heart of someone did. The heart man. Oh, wow. Okay, of heaven and earth. Okay. It's also been translated as the heart of the universe. We are the consciousness of the world, the psyche of the universe. Next. Okay, I'll probably skip this. I'll just say very quickly that the word for king also takes, taken from the time of Yao, takes these three characters, and the upright figure of the human is, again, what can unite all of those. Okay, next. Okay, the early Chinese, this is the most important way that they're connected to the human. The earliest dictionary says simply that Jun, and this is the most important character in China, I mean among the common people, it's not just a philosophical means to love each other and adds that it is the benevolence that must link each person with his or her neighbor. This thus mutuality, reciprocity, humaneness. And that's the character for you. Okay, now I'm going to jump here to Confucius who at one, at one point defines this by saying it is when you go abroad to behave to everyone as if you were receiving a great gift. To employ the people as if you were assisting at a great sacrifice not to do to others as you would not wish done to yourself. Okay, boy, I'll go through this. Uh, uh, this is so important, very quickly. This is the character for virtue. Remember, this is a quality of the universe. It is made up of, here the character for Shun, heart mind. Here the character for one that we've met. Here a character that stands for ten eyes, ten eyes have seen it. Here, the character for walking. And so I define this as single-heartedness, straight-heartedness, mindedness, in action before the world. Virtue, the inner force of one Tao, in action, the expression of one. Let's go again. Okay, we'll go again because I want to get on to the other one here. As the, as the human increasingly senses both his or her natural course, Tao, and the larger course, now of the way of heaven in which he or she is embedded, whether experienced in the inmost being or the external world, the arises the force of virtue, which is both the singular flowering of the individual nature and the quality of the universe coming into being. Next. Okay. Now, quickly, because this is very white heady and this is the second really all of these are interrelated, the character for one, the character for virtue. This character means completing or perfecting. The next. This the character, which is part of the whole character, is the character for speech. Okay, so I call I call this transliterate this character, literally translate this character as the expression of completing, which is everything. It's the universe is the expression of completing. We are the expression of completing. And it means completing the nature nature that we see around us, our own nature, every occasion. Next. 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 Okay. I, um, I'm going to use the translation. It's commonly translated sincerity, but it just doesn't feel right. There are other others, and Thomas Berry uses authenticity, and, and that's good. It is through authenticity and the expression of completing that the self, the individual nature, is completed and perfected. Its way is that by which the human must direct himself or herself. Without authenticity, there would be nothing. On this account, the self-cultivated human being regards the attainment of authenticity as the most excellent thing. The possessor of authenticity does not merely accomplish the self-completion of himself or herself. It's an interconnected universe. With this quality, he or she completes other people and things also. The completing of oneself shows one's perfect virtue. The completing of other people shows one's knowledge. Now, this is this is a Lazarus moment for the colossal corpse. 
Both these are virtues belonging to the nature, and this is the way by which a union is affected between the external and internal, internal subject and object. Okay, this, how does this actually happen? This, this really was the way it was done. This is supposed to say at the top that this is from the great learned the Confucian classic. The ancients wishing to illustrate illustrious virtue, ming, ming, da, two mings. First, it means to brighten. And Yu says the first brighten is inside, to brighten the inner virtue, which leads to the second ming, which is to take it out into the world. You see, it unfolds like a bud. So there's no internal, external. Okay. Uh, first ordered their own states. Now you can kind of zip through here. And then how they did this. They ordered well their own states to do this. They had to bring harmony with their families. To do this, they had to cultivate their persons. To do this, they had to rectify their hearts. They had to be sincere in their thoughts to do that. And in order to be sincere in their thoughts, they had to extend their knowledge. That was very important to them. And the extension of knowledge lay in the investigation of things. So those being investigated, their knowledge became complete thoughts became sincere. Their hearts were then rectified. Uh, their hearts being rectified, the persons were cultivated. Being cultivated, the fact, you see it's a circular reasoning that we hate so much. <coughs> families were regulated. Their families being regulated, the states were rightly governed. Their states being rightly governed, the whole kingdom was made tranquil and happy. Okay, from the son of heaven down, the emperor, down to the mass of the people, all must consider the cultivation of the person, the root of everything, Besides, every conversation about group reminds me of this one line, and the next one, my favorite. It cannot be when the root is neglected that what should spring from it will be well ordered. It has never been the case that what was of great importance has been slightly cared for. Great classic ecological statement. Next, please. Let's see. Okay, I mean, this is wonderful, but I can't do that one. I can't do that one. Okay, I want to end here. Yu Jing, uh, this is the character Yu, which means change. It's also like a homophone of the character for one. In all of the I Ching, there are a lot of, it's the book of change, there are a lot of um, instances of Pian and Hua, two forms of change, slow transformation, fast, and never in the entire text does this character appear. And I thought, well, how is that possible? Why isn't it there? And there's only one answer, something I think Josephine mentioned. This change is the universe, it's singular. In, in, in this particular uh, character originally was a lizard or a chameleon. You see? So it's, it's adapting, it's constantly changing, but it's one. It's a single thing. So it's not anywhere in there as, as this process or that process. It is the cosmos. It is, it is change. Just do one this thing just to say one. At midnight on the winter solstice, the mind of heaven is without a stir. When the first impulse of the eye sprouts before manifold creation has been born. When the taste of the subtle wine is as very faint. If you do not believe these words, then go ask a few sheep. Okay. Sorry, I had to skip to my head. Thank you.